um, by Chuck Schumacher, a a profile um, of um, John. Um, I'm just going to try and get rid of that. I don't know whether you can see that pop up on my press screen. Press got it. Just press got it. Sorry about that. Uh, Right. Um, so uh, there's a summary of, of his main, many contributions, but one of one of his most important contributions, in my view, was something called the Oxford System of Medicine. Now, this is pretty historic. It's it's 30 years ago that he developed this, but it's a great way of representing knowledge explicitly, firstly, as facts. So you can see a list of facts about diabetes, most of which I hope you'll agree with. But those facts were operated on by some generic rules um and this is props to its prologue like syntax so a capitalized atom like patient means it's a variable um and there's for all instantiation unlike um prologue um so for example if you had some data about a patient let's call her mrs smith and these facts around a knowledge base and those generic rules here's the patient data mrs smith has polyuria etc cetera, etc cetera, then those rules would go on to make various inferences. For example, that polyuria is an argument for Mrs. Smith having diabetes, and that's from rule one. I think you can uh, see that. Um, blurred vision is also an argument, and tingling feet is an argument for Mrs. Smith having di diabetes. And then from rule two, you can infer that, that since the number of symptoms is more than two, that Mrs. Smith probably has diabetes. Again, you might object with that. This is an argumentation approach uh, rather than probabilistic approach. Um, if you add a further finding, this is in this case a lab finding, then you can actually develop some diag a diagnosis and some suggested treatments from the remaining rules, rule, rule three and rule four. And you can see how all of that would work in a a forward chaining prologue like um, in a uh, knowledge based systems environment. So, this was a very important contribution to AI and uh, medical AI in particular, moving away from multiple hundreds of special case rules to representing your knowledge as facts and then generic rules. Much more maintainable, much more easier to understand, and also much easier to generate helpful explanations. And it's an example of computable knowledge. Um, so that knowledge was in fact computable in the Prox2 environment as an uh, English-like syntax. Um, but there are different levels of computability. Um, and uh, Boxwaller and others have developed a very helpful hierarchy or levels of computability, le going from uh, level one, unstructured text narrative. So for example, a clinical practice guideline from the NICE website would be level one. If you then produce deep links to specific fragments of that um, guideline. That would be what we call level 2A, um, a tagged fragment. Uh, if you organize the text um, in, into a more structured format uh, with a kind of controlled vocabulary, then that would become level 2B. And if it's then more structured with um, all the data elements defined and in, in a defined logic uh, to support a decision, that would be level 3. And only when it gets to level four would we call it actually executable knowledge. So when it's actually um, as a, uh, if you like, a software um, computer syntax. Um, so we're all the the, 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 the the symbolism that we expect with uh, computer languages. So looking here, um, uh, this would be a, a different area, but it's gestational diabetes rather than um, type 2 diabetes. But the human readable knowledge, this is extracted from a nice pathway on gestational diabetes. So here is some human readable knowledge that relates to gestational diabetes uh, and the risk factors. And here is some compu uh, computer executable knowledge in CGL. That's the clinical, um, actually it's CQL or the CGL. It's a clinical quality language. Um, so uh, a number of you know different things which are in some ways quite indigestible. Not they're not easily read, but you can see how the uh, statements on the left do correspond to uh, the, 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 the the computer computable code on the right. So you may say, well, this is all very well, but can it actually be done and can it be useful in practice? And I was part of a, a project in the Netherlands a few years ago now. Um, led by Rick Hood, who was a PhD student. Um, and he worked alongside 
uh, some guideline developers um, in the domain of um, prevent prevention of, of uh, um, primary or no, was secondary prevention in heart disease. Um, and he developed, as they were working, he developed a computable knowledge base um, of the guideline they were developing. And actually that feedback that he gave them, he was they were able to improve the quality of the guideline as a result. Because for example, he was saying, well, hang on, you, last week you said something else about this. And I've got a representation here which is incompatible with that. It's, it's paradoxical. Um, so they were able to, through that interaction with um, a, a knowledge engineer, uh, the guideline committee were able to produce a much more coherent and consistent complete guideline. And that knowledge base was then subject to a randomized trial in a decision support system, actually a team-based decision support system. And we published that in the BMJ, and you can see that it did indeed lead to improved concordance with guideline recommendations, uh, except in the last one, exercise therapy, where there was probably a ceiling effect. Uh, people were already doing it in the, in the control group by 85%. So that's all very well, but the problem is that that's a lot of work to develop an individual data knowledge base for a decision support system. And what we have is lots of people developing lots of knowledge bases, um, even in the same domain and from the same guideline. So we have a bit of a cottage industry of knowledge system developers. Uh, and here, let's take the example of a cardiac risk tool. Maybe for a web-based cardiac risk tools, one group develop a formula. Then there might be an app developed by a different organization, a a different formula, but actually representing the same guideline, a wearable, a diagnostic device, a risk calculator embedded. You can see how lots of people are converting knowledge into computable format for their own individual systems, whether it's an app or a decision support system, etc. cetera. Um, and that leads to a whole range of challenges. First of all, it's difficult for developers. They've got to find that knowledge. They've got to source it from documents designed for humans. They weren't designed to be uh, easily translated into computable format. Then they've got to choose between a whole range of different um, computable guideline languages, validating the knowledge base that they've developed, um, and then maintaining it, ideally. But the trouble is, of course, they don't often maintain it. But that's costly. There's wasteful repetition, it may not be accurate, and it leads to potentially fragmented care with different knowledge um, underlying different systems in primary, secondary care, or self-care. And here's an example of the, the challenges that can lead to. Of course, we're busy trying to link up electronic systems used for patient self-monitoring at home, nurse-led remote monitoring, primary care, secondary care, maybe even a uh, a care home and primary prevention apps as well. We are managing to get some of the data, data flows. What we haven't yet done though, is get the knowledge flows from a single set of shared algorithms so that everybody is following the same guideline um, and it's represented in the same way. And that's, that would be much more efficient if we could represent knowledge once and then it could be um, uh, used in all these different apps and, and, and tools in different locations. And, and that's what um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the our vision is, that we have a computable biomedical knowledge ecosystem which helps to mobilize knowledge. So you really just have one up-to-date evidence-based cardiac risk form formula in standard format, which can then be used in all those different apps and tools. And the advantage of that is that it's done done once and then curated. Uh, so there's just one version to develop, validate and maintain. It's standardized and quality assured. That single source of knowledge drives knowledge systems across a variety of settings. So there's consistency. Um, it's also a single destination for any comments and corrections and updates. And if you develop this knowledge base, computable knowledge library, it would vastly lower the barrier to market entry for new knowledge systems. So people who currently are developing an app uh, for cardiac risk, they have to develop their own knowledge base. They have to find a reliable source of knowledge and make it into computer format. Well, they wouldn't have to do that anymore. They just have to subscribe to this knowledge library. And it might also make it more likely that guideline committees will record their outputs in a computer format at the time of guidance development, rather than trying to do it later when um, those inconsistencies and so on um, will, will, will surface. So this is the global MCBK movement, mobilizing computable biomedical knowledge. It's all about championing health and care knowledge as a precious asset. 
um, to be mobilized in a computable readable format um, to support de better decisions. And replacing that cottage industry that I've described with high quality computable knowledge libraries that conform to global standards and fair principles. And then realizing the benefits, most of which we've gone through, I think. Um, and it, the, the bottom line, the, the bottom bullet point, new knowledge is disseminated faster and the quality and consistency of health and care decisions improves. Um, so looking at that in diagrammatic format, our vision of MCBK is that we it all revolves around an index library of knowledge objects, uh, which obviously includes a, a variety of tools and utilities. Um, and then the knowledge uh, objects are, each have their own metadata in, uh, on the blue box, and then the knowledge payload, what the algorithm, the rule, the score, the fact, whatever it is. Uh, we haven't really decided what the granularity should be. And then that knowledge can be sought uh, by a knowledge request and delivered to a whole range of different knowledge users from risk scoring systems to chatbots and even medical robots, uh, drug dosing systems, uh, insulin pumps, all of these things need computable knowledge. And the knowledge can come from a whole range of different um, sources, from guideline authors, as we taught, Cochrane collaboration, data mining, et cetera, et cetera, down to medical publishers. So that we think will have a whole range of different uh, benefits for different stakeholder groups. There isn't time to go through all of these, but we think that actually there could be benefits even for the UK economy, um, improved pro productivity and highly skilled jobs and opportunities for innovation, enterprise and global revenue. But over all this looms the shadow of regulation. How much of this knowledge in these knowledge lab libraries would be regulated? Um, and, and software as a medical device. So should I just pause there for a minute? Um, I've covered a lot of ground already, um, Abdul. It, 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 are there any questions about what I've said so far? Um, really factual type questions. Any questions? Anyone? I can't see the chat, I'm afraid, at the moment, so... Yeah, I, I can see a chat. There's nothing in the chat. Hopefully they can they can turn on the, the mic and, uh, and speak. We have one question here from Catherine. Megan. Hello. Hi, I'm in the classroom. Uh, and also Hi. Megan. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Catherine, Hi. go to the classroom. Go on, Catherine. And then yes. Megan next. I'm, I'm just wondering about the... the how does the um, MCBK movement uh, work in the global context, and is there how far on the path would you say that it is to becoming something standardized uh, globally, like Cochrane Library or something like that? A great question, and we are decades behind Cochrane. Cochrane started in 1992 in Canada, actually. Um, in a meeting at McMaster that I was involved in, but um, so yeah, we're a long way behind Cochrane, 30 years at least. Um, the MCBK movement has actually been going since 2018, I think it was, or 2017. It's actually led by Chuck Friedman um, at um, the... Um, uh, yeah, he was a speaker the... here a couple of weeks ago. Sorry? He was he with was you? He was a speaker here a couple of weeks ago, yeah. yes. Great. Oh, well, you know all about MCBK then. So <laughs> you're absolutely, it's a great question. And obviously, the, the, really, the, the, the aspiration is that it, it should be standardised. And there is a, a working group on standards. I'm not sure what they've, uh, where they've got to quite yet. I'm not a technical person, but um, it's a crucial point that we do need to agree on the right standards. Uh, and as I hinted at earlier on the slide, there are many potential knowledge standards, but um, all of this needs to link in with um, HL7 and FHIR and so on um, mm -hmm. to, to be able to match up with the, with the data sources. So uh, it's, it's quite complicated, but there are some emerging standards, which um, I don't, I'm not really qualified to talk about, but, but CQL is part of it and BPM plus. CQL, thank you. Thank you. And Megan? Yes, yeah, so my question was around um, any sort of the uh, negative side effects that you can see. So you've talked about benefits realization, but has there been any um, investigations as to what could potentially go wrong? The reason why I ask is because I'm assuming they're looking at regulation as a, as a way to ensure um, that there isn't potentially any uh, thing that could go wrong. 
So this is a very good point that we need to make sure that as well as being fair, the knowledge that's in these libraries is trustworthy. And Chuck Freeman and others talk about fair hyphen T with the T for trustworthiness. Um, and that is a very important point that we need to have some kind of quali quality assurance process um, and curation, making sure that the knowledge is up to date. The knowledge that there needs to be standardized metadata so you know where the knowledge has come from. Um, and you know, I, my view is that we shouldn't be allowing opinions uh, into the knowledge library. Others may differ, but at least if you know what the source of the knowledge is, what the process is that it's gone through to, to, to emerge as computable knowledge, then you could potentially filter. I'm not interested in opinions, I'm not even interested in the results of individual studies. I only want to know about the results of systematic reviews or national guidelines rather than a guideline that a local institution has put together kind of on the back of an envelope. So uh, not, not, not being evidence-based. So that's a crucial question. How do we assure quality or at least fitness for purpose, which is what quality is about? So for some purposes, it may be appropriate to have people's opinions or local knowledge. I see Carl has a question or point. Yeah, Carl's got the questions. Carl? Yeah, I'm... Can you hear me? Indeed, yeah. Yeah, I can. Yes, nice to nice to see you again, Carl. Yeah, nice to see you again. Okay, guys, uh, Jeremy, uh, what the association I have is uh, if we can create these knowledge bases, and uh, I fully agree with you. We need not only standards, we need the coding systems, we need fire, we need the implementation guides, we need the testing of these guides. It's a huge activity, but yeah. if we have this very detailed, very reliable knowledge, do we need these medical devices? I assume you are talking about, or can we just say, oh, we just put this into artificial intelligence, whatever method we use, and that will solve the problem? Or what would be the difference between the approach you bring here and the, all the hype about yeah, artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, Great question. What What so, is the relationship or, or disconnect or what? I, my view is that there's a relationship and that to some extent the, the, the knowledge libraries can encompass knowledge that's based on or derived from a variety of different sources. I've, I've talked in some detail about knowledge from computable guidelines so that's explicit knowledge represented as facts and rules, for example. But it, equally, we could include algorithms derived by machine learning, deep learning from large um, re representative databases. Um, so the kind of um, uh, and, and potentially even knowledge graphs um, and, and other kinds of knowledge, the kind of thing that underlies chat GPT. So we could include a whole range of different knowledge types as well as sources. Um, and at the moment, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I don't see this as just being confined to explicit knowledge uh, uh, in the traditional knowledge-based systems um, uh, uh, school, of, school of thought. Um, it doesn't exclude the contemporary machine learning, deep learning um, AI models. Does that answer Thank your you. question, Carl? Thank you. Um, there is a question from uh, in a chat. Can I, I'll just read it. In uh, what way okay. does in what way does incursion of black box of AI help or complicate all of these? Uh, yes, it's a it's a very good question. And actually, when we start to talk about regulation, I think that there is a, there are some deep questions there about black box type systems in which you really don't quite understand what the knowledge is. All you know is, is perhaps something about the very large database from which it's been derived and the results of some validation studies. Um, and when you start talking about trustworthy knowledge, I think many clinicians have serious doubts about relying on black box type um, yeah. knowledge sources. But again, if the if you took the the, the the very inclusive approach to these knowledge libraries i think what you could do is you'd say well let's let, let's allow that in as well for some purposes that might be perfectly acceptable for example if you're using the knowledge 
to guide research or to guide education or for some other reason, mm -hmm. uh, for population screening, for some low risk procedure, for example. Mm -hmm. You might say, well, a black box algorithm, as long as it's incredibly mm -hmm. accurate, more accurate than alternatives, that's fine. You might not want to use it for clinical decision making. Mm -hmm. You might not want to use it in an in insulin pump, for example, where it, it's a high risk application. So I would take ten, rather than censoring and saying, well, we're only going to have the best uh, explicit knowledge. And I think I would take the, 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 the inclusive view and say that we, 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 we if, if, if that black box knowledge, black box knowledge object has a genuine application, then let's include it in the, in the, in the knowledge library. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So okay. shall we resume? Now, this is uh, assuming that I can get back into what I was doing. Uh, yes, hopefully it's left in the same place as well. Right, and maximize. So we, we, we were talking about the benefits of this approach. Right, are you seeing the preview there or not? I, yes, we are. You're seeing the preview again? Yeah. <laughs> ah. It was proper. Right, I'm just trying to reshare. So screen two, I need to select screen two. Yeah. Apologies, I should have tried this out on a on a, a local talk rather than an <laughs> international one halfway across the world. Okay, so let's move on to thinking about the regulation um, of medical device in the UK. So um what I what I'm going to be talking about now is is very much about the UK position. And actually, it's UK excluding Northern Ireland because technically Northern Ireland is still virtually part of um, the EU for, com for complicated reasons. Um, <laughs> however, um, the, 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 the approach that's been taken in, in the UK is very similar to the approach being taken in many other countries, uh, the EU, North America, etc., uh, because it follows the EU Medical Devices Directive. So, as you probably know most of this, that if a manufacturer claims a device can support diagnosis, prevention, or the treatment of disease of pregnant, it's considered to be a medical device. Um, even though it might be, for example, um, something very non-medical, like a, um, a pregnancy test kit is considered to be a medical device, even though it's not being used in a medical setting. Um, if it's a medical device, then what regulators do is they assess the risk class, and there are typically three or four different risk classes, and then they regulate the device according to this. For example, the lowest risk devices, all the manufacturer has to do is do a self-assessment and then register that their device exists with the MHRA, the, Medi the Medicines Regulator in, in, in UK. But if it's a higher risk device, there's there's increasing burden, for example, writing a clinical safety case, doing ha having quality safety management systems, a nominated safety officer, process for handling reports, et cetera, et cetera. It really becomes quite burdensome um, if you're producing a high risk of us. And I think as, as patients, all of us would actually think that's a good idea, that it, it, it's important that medical devices with high risk are heavily regulated. Another important point is that devices regulation also applies to the components that are supplied with the regulated device. So even if it's just, um, uh, well, for example, the instructions are part of the uh, device and are regulated. And any software that's supplied with the medical device is, is a medical device. Now, the question is, does that mean that computable knowledge objects in a library will be regulated as a medical device? And if so, then that, again, means that there'll be a considerable burden in assembling these libraries. <clears throat> so our project was all about understanding which computable knowledge objects are most likely to be regulated as a medical device in the UK. <laughs> Excuse me. And we did this by writing a briefing paper, circulating it to a whole range of different um, people from different disciplines, including lawyers, device regulators, software engineers, digital health academics, and even um, the, the chief knowledge officer and librarian of the NHS. And then we held a one day workshop. Um, we had 25 people, it was an invited workshop in London, had some really interesting discussions and breakout sessions there. We then, mm -hmm drafted a discussion paper which was circulated to participants and we incorporated the comments we had several iterations in fact so i'm really going on now to describe what's in our article which is now published in learning health systems 
So um, we start with some key definitions, and we've talked about much of this already. What is a medical device? It's a um, yeah, necessary blah, 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 diagnosis, prevention, monitoring, treatment, or alleviation of disease, compensation for injury, or handicap. I abbreviated that on the previous slide. Or investigation, replacement, modification, anatomy, or physiological process, or control of conception. And that all comes from the UK medical devices regulation, which are based on the EU medical devices uh, directive. Um, and there's a couple of footnotes there. What is software? Well, that was defined in a, uh, a regulation called MedDev 2.16 as a set of instructions that process input data and creates output data. And there's also a detail there about what is the purpose? Well, it's what the manufacturer says the, the product is for. Um, and note that this excludes Northern Ireland, as I said, uh, and you can by all means follow that. And yes, actually, these definitions do follow closely that of the International Medical Device Regulators Forum. The IMDRF have got a lot of useful um, articles, including one on software as a medical device and key definitions about several papers on software as a medical device, if you're interested. So the obvious question is, is computable knowledge software? Remember the definition of software, a set of instructions that process input data and creates output data. So here are some facts. Are facts represented like that, a set of instructions that process input data and create output data? I would argue they are not. And so if you put those facts as knowledge objects into a computable knowledge library, it certainly wouldn't count as software. But remember, there was another component. These are facts and rules from the Oxford system as <coughs> knowledge base. So these generic rules, can they process input data and create output data? I would argue that they can. Now, not though as they are written just there. They seem to be, be written almost in plain English. So if these rules were present in a, a software environment that could directly interpret and execute them, then that would count as software. But as they stand, just as text on a on a uh, in a document they aren't a set of they, they can't process input data by themselves they would have to be um supplied with with um uh, as i say a software environment and john fox and his team developed such a software environment called prox2 which had this um, prologue like syntax so by itself if you just included these generic rules in a knowledge library no they wouldn't be um software so that's an attempt to kind of illustrate the complexity of this, that it is, a, it, it, superficially, it looks as though that is software, but it's not really software. It is just text uh, until you build it into, uh, incorporate it or import it into an environment that can interpret that text as software. Cutting the, to the chase now. Um, here is a simple algorithm that really summarizes the, 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 the argument that we, we put forward in our article. If you've got a knowledge object that's already supplied with or part of a medical device, well, that, yes, that will be regulated because it's been supplied with a medical device. Whatever that knowledge object is, even if it's just a fact, that because it's been supplied, so that kind of overrules everything else. If it's not supplied or part of a medical device, the first question is, does that knowledge object include software, as we were just arguing? If it doesn't, then it's definitely not software as a medical device. If it does include software, then it also has to have a medical purpose. And here are the definitions of software and medical purpose. And if it does have a medical purpose and it counts as software, then yes, that gets to be regulated. So that in one slide really summarizes the position as we see it. And I have to say, we did have referees for our article and they didn't seem to object to this. It's obviously a bit of an oversimplification in some ways. There are some more subtlety about the different kinds of regulation, for example, this in vitro devices and so on. But that, there's a, there's, that, that, that really is, is a, a fairly accurate summary of, of the position as we see it in the UK. Another way of looking at this, if I've still got time, is just to quickly look at revisit Boxwaller's knowledge typology, which you remember went from level one on structure test up to level four executable. Um, so the first question, I've added some columns here to this table. Um, is it regulated and why? And so we conclude that the first four rows in the table, remember there's a 2A and 2B, um, are not regulated. We explain the reasons for that. Um, 
But the final one, executable knowledge. If you've got software um, actually in a knowledge object, that will be regulated because it's intended for clinical decision support and becomes part of the clinical decision support system. Uh, and that's the abbreviations. Um, so that really is the summary of our findings. Uh, just to quickly flash up some conclusions, knowledge objects are likely to be regulated if they're supplied with a medical device or are executable and designed for a medical purpose. So if you are putting knowledge in uh, a knowledge object in a knowledge library, you might want to restrict the um, computability of your knowledge to level three to help reduce the risk that it will be regulated if you're concerned about that. Equally, making a knowledge object multi-purpose, for example, that it can support education research as well as clinical practice, that might also help the risk of regulatory attention, as I put it there. I'm being slightly unkind to the regulators. I'm making it sound like we don't really want their attention. We want to escape it somehow. But actually, um, for some purposes, it is it is sensible to think about how you might reduce the risk that things are, are need to be regulated. But remember, other countries and other regulators may have different views. If you want to see our paper, uh, you should be able to use that QR code to uh, go directly to it. It's free open text on the Learning Health System website. So that's really all I've got to say, Abdul. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, um, brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and David um, no, not at all. had a, his hand up previously one of my students and um, hopefully David you there I'm just going to stop sharing if anybody wants to click on that QR code you've got three two one no seconds there we go Hi, yeah, okay. okay fascinating stuff Jeremy I, having participated in decisions in government to either regulate or not regulate it's complicated ah. stuff two aspects yes. of this which you haven't touched on I'd really be interested in your comments one, in some cases, we decided not to regulate because we had no enforcement route that we could follow. So uh -huh. we could look at regulation and then be criticized for never enforcing it. The second is the aspect of what is the implication on liability. So I'm assuming, I don't know, in the UK, as in North America, sovereign immunity protects the regulator. The device manufacturer, provider, I'm assuming could then duck under the rubric of, well, the regulators approved our product, so you, the consumer, it's all on you when it goes wrong. It's not our fault. The practitioner, I'm assuming, gets caught in the middle. Well, you used this in my treatment, and it went wrong, so it's your fault. How does the, how does the two aspects work in the UK context? That's very interesting. We didn't really examine or, or, or explore implications for liability um, in that paper. We have done some other work on liability, um, and uh, that's come out in Medical Law Review this year with first author Caroline Jones. Um, yes, I and if there's time, I might be able to cut and paste and put that link in the in the in the in the in the chat. Um, so. Um, it's quite a long and complex story about uh, legal liability, but you're absolutely right to say that I, I, we, we, we've not thought of the regulator being joined in a suit uh, for liability. Um, it would normally be the producer, the developer um, of the de decision support product and the user, the intermediary, uh, the healthcare professional. Um, and one of the big issues, which we don't in the UK have any case law to um, to to support, is whether a court will treat a decision support system as a service or a product. And if they treat it as a product, then strict liability will apply. And if the, the, the litigant can prove that there was a fault in the product, then they will automatically be liable in, uh, in full for, the, for damages. If it's considered as a service, then the position is slightly more um uh, yeah as long as the developer and the user can demonstrate they took reasonable steps to validate the system and that they were trained in using the system and so on um and and, and um weren't cavalier in that they they, they um exercise professional judgment 
um, with a reasonable standard of, of, of expertise that would be um, in the, a bit, bit like the Bolum test, although that's slightly out of date now. Um, so happy to have another discussion and, and maybe, Abdul, we could have a, 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 I'd be happy to share the, um, the the gist of our quite long paper in medical law review. Maybe I'll get, get Caroline to do it, actually, because she's a, a, a legal academic who I've collaborated with considerably over this. Um, but um, I, I don't know if that helps, um, David, with, with, with your question, but... Um... It, it helps. I, I, I sort of get the impression that the answer lies in studying the case law precedents country by country, because... Yeah. For example, one of our concerns when I was working in the U.S. is the courts had actually changed over the decades. And uh, before, yeah. there was no question. I mean, you guys are doing the right stuff. And yeah, you can have secrecy, et cetera, et cetera. But more recently, no, transparency is required. And no, you can't just hide behind sovereign immunity. In some cases, mm -hmm. it went wrong. You were OK in the way you were motivated. But because it went wrong, you own some of the liability. Yeah, strict product liability is like that, isn't it? However much care you take, if if the, if, if the litigant pr proved that there was a fault in, in whatever it is, it could be vacuum cleaner or software, then you're liable, however much care you took. Yeah, and there's so many yeah. wackos coming into power in some places. <laughs> wonder I can't imagine who you could possibly it. mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, just one other little thing to mention is that the FDA has recently taken a, an interesting policy on medical apps, for example, of enforcement discretion. I think partly because there's such an overwhelming number of um, uh, amounted medical software. And I think they, they've been looking at the track record of software where producers and if they've got a long track record they tend to behave as if like medical device manufacturers even if they're doing software then they'll say well actually we'll, we won't pay too much attention to you guys we'll trust you to get on with it whereas if it's a teenager in their in their bedroom developing a diabetes self um, management <laughs> app they might be a little bit more uh, fierce uh, i see there's another question dennis, dennis yeah dennis yeah by the way dennis Oh, hi. Hi, hi Jeremy. Hi, Thanks the, hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, how, how would you evaluate if the knowledge is better than the traditional system we have in, in a clinical setting, for, for instance? You've developed uh, all, all this knowledge, it's it's doing the execution. How will you make sure that it's better than what we have or evaluate it eventually? That's a really good question. And I think different people will have different views. And as I said, quality... Um, if you look up the ISO definition is fitness for purpose. And mm -hmm. so different purposes mm -hmm. may require different kinds of knowledge. Um, and um, as I mentioned, I think the example of an insulin um, infusion pump, yeah. I would say that you really need the best quality knowledge that you really are very confident because you're in a, in a very high risk situation there. If the in, infusion rate of insulin either stops or goes too fast, uh, you could potentially have a fatality on your hands. So um, there you I, I'm not quite sure how they validate that knowledge. because They, they presumably use safety critical systems um, design and develop the software engineering methods. Um, so they have implementable specifications and all that kind of stuff. And you know, there's, a, there's a language called Z, which comes into that. Um, so um, that and, and so you, you would assess as much the development process, um, design and development process as the actual product itself. Um, and I think that's quite often the case with software engineering, that what you're looking at is uh, not necessarily just the final product, although that's important, but also how it was developed. Um, who developed it, the quality of the team. Um, if we're just talking about the quality of the knowledge base, of the computable knowledge, mm -hmm. um, if you're talking about that knowledge embedded 